Hey guys, it's Steve from Featherlight, and today we are talking about this little beast of a mixer, the Soundcraft 8FX. This thing has got a secret weapon built into it that nobody is talking about, especially now in 2020. It is a hidden feature that makes this thing a tracking, podcasting, and overdubbing monster, and there's nobody anywhere near its price range that can offer the same features. Let's check it out. So as you can see, this is a really compact device. It's about half the size of a laptop. All the controls and sliders are on the surface of the mixer. It can accept up to eight total inputs and there isn't anything on the sides, bottom or back than the power supply input. Now, because this device is not bus powered, that might seem like a drawback until you consider that a lot of modern day devices that are bus powered don't provide enough voltage because of the onboard USB controller cards to get up to true 48 volt phantom power like this mixer can. And that's a big deal if you're talking about recording, especially for power hungry microphones like tubes and condensers. So that's a big plus. So let's break this down on a channel by channel basis. While the power supply itself does have an on LED, the unit itself doesn't have an on and off switch because the unit is always powered on once it's plugged in. Because this is not a bus powered device, it isn't draining your computer's battery. Also, the fan and power on this is always on because there's only two mic inputs and they both share it. So the fan and power can't be defeated. That might be an issue, for example, if you're using some kind of microphones that are sensitive to phantom power. So keep that in mind. So the first thing we notice is that it's got two microphones inputs on the first two channel strips and these are Neutrik combination connectors that means they can accept both a microphone input which is our standard XLR connector here it can accept a line input that's balanced so you'll notice this actually has a tip ring and sleeve so that's a line level signal but it's balanced so it's nice and clean and it can also take a regular unbalanced signal that has just the tip and sleeve and then this would plug in to our channel strip. For example, if we wanted to record a guitar straight into the interface, or for example, a passive bass, we could simply engage the high Z button on here, and this turns that into a DI box. So you don't have to buy an extra DI box. It's got one built right into it simply by pressing that switch. All right, directly under our low frequency roll off shelves, we have our two gain knobs. Now the gain knobs are maybe the most important thing on a mixer. They're the most important thing on any mixer because this is where you set the level that's gonna be going directly to your recording software and to the mixer. And this is really where you're gonna be setting the signal to noise ratio. So this process is known as gain staging or peaking the channel. It is super important that you get the loudest, strongest amount of signal into the channel without the channel peaking or distorting. And you don't want it so quiet that it's really noisy when you use the volume slider or knob to make up the difference. And how we do that is we send the loudest part of the signal into the mixer, and then we adjust the gain knob so that that peak light lights only during the very loudest parts. And then we back that gain knob off just a hair so that it's right under peaking, but not peaking. And then we can adjust our volume to taste. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna yell into the microphone until we see that peak light light up. And then we're gonna back that gain knob off just under that. Check, check, check. All right, so we spoke into the microphone and we tried to get as loud as we could. This is a really low output microphone. It's an SM7B, which is really a testament to this mixer's gain structure. It has enough gain on board to be able to use an SM7B, which is a notoriously quiet microphone. So we've got the channel set up so that it's got the best possible signal to noise ratio. It's not peaking or distorting the channel, but it's not too quiet that it's gonna be noisy either. Directly under that, we have our equalization section. That's these black top knobs here. And these guys are amazingly good quality for a mixer in this price range. Unheard of, actually. It's got a 12K shelf on the top, which is really sweet and musical. And as we engage that, you'll hear my voice start to have more high end and more air, for example. The middle section is a 2.5K mids control. But unlike a lot of mids, if it even has a mids control on a mixer of this price range, unlike many of them, 
it's a, it's a static band. This one, however, is what's called a dynamic band. When you cut mids out, it doesn't just take the mids out of your voice. It makes a very steep band when you're cutting. But when you boost, that band changes and becomes a very broad band, a very broad band boost. And that's exactly the kind of thing you want. Broad band boosts, meaning when you're raising the mids, is a much more musical way to do it. So this does that for you automatically without you having to adjust the cue of that band in the mid-range. So super unusual in something of this price range and very musical. The bottom is an 80 hertz roll-off or boost. So as we roll that up, you hear more bottom end in my voice. And if we take it out, it's a great way to thin out really muddy sound sources as well. That's our EQ section. Right after that, we have our AUX knob sections. And these ones, we're going to talk about in more depth in the many different configurations they can be used. Directly under that is our pan knob, which means we can pan our incoming signal either to the left or the right, depending on which position the pan is in. And then finally, after all of that, we have our volume knob. And this just changes the volume. After all these changes are made, the signal kind of flows like a river. It comes in the top, hits the gain stage knob, and goes down through the channel and exits out the volume control. Rounding out the other inputs on the mixer, we've got channels three and four, which are combination left and right. So channel one, channel two, channel three and four is three and four. So those are combination stereo inputs. You could plug in, for example, stereo inputs out of a synthesizer or out of another audio source. Or you could plug in just one side of it. And that's handy, for example, if you have just a signal that only has a monophonic output, for example. So same thing with channels five and six. You got mono inputs or left and right for that. So there's channel one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then rounding out the last of the inputs on the mixer is channels seven and eight. This is where our USB to and from the computer is going to come back from. And in addition, it's going to mix that input with our RCA style connectors. And you've probably seen these before. These are unbalanced RCA style connectors. You're likely to see these on record player outputs, or maybe you've got a cord out of your MP3 player or your phone. This is a great way to get that kind of audio into the mixer, and it just shows up right here. So we've got final thoughts on channel seven and eight. It's unique in the sense that this is where the audio from our computer is coming back from, and that's important for a couple of reasons. One, it allows you to record all the audio that's coming from your digital audio workstation, for example, or any any other audio that plays on your computer, browsers, for example, YouTube videos, and incoming phone calls, all those things you're going to want to record if you're in a podcasting circumstance. Let's talk a little bit about the mains section of the board itself. After we've made all of our adjustments to the individual channels, the culmination of all of these channels is going to send to the master fader and eventually the two left and right outputs. Those are designed to go to studio monitors. And it's important to note that this fader is completely independent of that mix. That's really unusual and super handy when you're trying to track, which means you can turn your stereo output to your studio monitors down completely, and it doesn't affect the mix that you have going to your headphones. All right, so now it's time to talk about the AUX bus section of this mixer board. It is without a doubt the thing that separates this from any other mixer board anywhere near its price category, especially when you look at the Yamahas and you look at the Mackie Pro FX version 3 boards, this guy really smokes them in this one regard. And the reason why is this AUX bus configuration can be used in one of three ways, and they're incredibly flexible. So let's break it down. The first configuration is going to be the most traditional for a mixing board, and that's going to be to use the AUX bus here to send the channel's individual levels to the master bus knob and that final culmination of all these channels is then going to go to our effects device. So, for example, if we have our AUX master knob up to, say, let's say 50%, and I have my reverb button engaged right there, which means I am sending that signal to the reverb, and I change our AUX knob on channel 2, which is where our microphone is coming from, as I start to raise that knob you're gonna to start to hear reverb in the background because I'm sending that channel's send over to the master and then on to our effects device. So this knob over here, this is the parameter change knob 
and it works for all three effects engines. So on the reverb side, if we turn it all the way counterclockwise, we have a really short ambience plate. So a short, short room that has just a little bit of an ambience plate. And if I turn the send all the way up, you can hear it even more. As we rotate the knob clockwise, it starts to choose different reverb patterns based on its selection position. As we continue to go more clockwise, the reverb plate itself is gonna get longer and more dense. It takes a bit to change from one to the other. So there's an even longer plate. And as we go forward to the clockwise position, check one, two, we get into the hall reverbs. And those are longer, more lush, more low. Let's return this back to about the middle. Same thing works for the other two effects engines. The chorus effects engine, when it's depressed, it's a subtle effect, so you're probably gonna wanna turn the send up more to hear it. So here we're gonna start off with a subtle chorus. And we're gonna increase the send to the effects device so you can hear more of it. Now we're going to depress the reverb button because all the effects engines can be used simultaneously. All right, so let's turn that guy back to about 50% and go to the third and final effects engine, and that's the delay engine. So down here in the shortest of it, these delays are going to be fairly short in short terms of in feedback. Terms of feedback. Yeah. And we'll turn it back down. So as you can hear, the delay is actually only repeating one time. The more clockwise we turn that knob, the longer the feedback for the delay will become. Check. 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 All right, so we have the three different engines to work with, reverb, chorus, modulation, and then delay is the final reverb engine. And the final thing where the delay is concerned is that it has a tap tempo. This is super handy for guitar, for example. So if I want the tempo to be one, two, three, four, five, check. Check, 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 one, two, two, two. And that's the first application for our AUX bus as an effects send. Now let's talk about the second application for the AUX bus system on this mixer. If we take a regular line level unbalanced cable and we plug it into that jack and this switch is in the up position, this AUX bus system now becomes a true monitor system, which means as I turn up each individual channel's AUX send and all those culminate here like it did before with the effects device into our AUX master bus, that now goes to that jack and that connector could be connected to a powered monitor, for example, as a stage monitor and you have a complete monitor system for all the channels on the mixer system. And our third and final configuration for our AUX bus system on this mixer is that hidden feature that we talked about. This secret weapon really makes this mixer an amazing monster of a mixer. So instead of using this as a monitor out like we just finished, we're gonna go back to our output knob type here and we're gonna make sure that it's in the depressed position. So that means that switch is in the down position and we are gonna plug in, yep, a set of stereo headphones. And now with that in its depressed position, that becomes a second completely independent stereo headphone output. And that's gonna be controlled by our AUX master knob here. So now we have two completely independent stereo headphone mixes. That right there makes this a game changer especially when you consider podcasting and overdubbing and multi-tracking. So let's set up the mixer for a couple of common configurations that are really gonna take advantage of this amazing feature. So first let's set up the mixer for a basic podcasting setup. This would be where there's 
two guest vocalists, and they're going to be talking back and forth. And then they're going to be also doing things like accepting incoming phone calls. And we need to be able to have control over all those different levels. So first things we want to do is we want to add a microphone. So our guest vocalist has a microphone. And we're going to take check, check, one, the trim two, and set one, it up two. for her microphone. And we're going to set her volume so that it's to her taste only and her EQ. And then we're also going to add an extra pair of headphones. This is going to be her headphone send. So for example, she can have her microphone a little bit louder than our microphone. And we can blend in the feedback or the return from the computer to her taste. And that can be completely different than ours. So her mix is up here. Our mix is down here. Our mix is being controlled by the headphone output here. Her headphone send is being controlled by the AUX send. If at any point we need to monitor what she's hearing, for example, to solve problems or to chase down any hums or buzzes we might be hearing that's only in her mix, the button directly above the main headphone output allows us to instantly toggle back and forth between monitoring her mix and ours. This is a super powerful feature, especially if the guest vocalist is not in the same room. Maybe they're in an isolation booth. You can immediately hear exactly what they're hearing and what their mix sounds like. Now that we've got the mixer set up for our podcasting session, we need to go into our Soundcraft USB audio control panel, and we're going to make sure that we're recording the mix out. This allows us to record everything coming into the mixer and is a similar but much better version of the new loopback feature that's starting to appear on newer interfaces. This allows us complete control over the audio, including incoming phone calls. We are going to test our FaceTime call. Hey, are you there? Yo, I am here. Oh, awesome. Awesome. How's it sound on your end? Does it sound like, uh, is there any weird echo or anything? Uh, you? Yeah. No, not at all. Um, you sound much clearer and crisper. Ah, um, great. We're golden. Well, hey, real quick then, yeah. I want to give a shout out to uh, Snob Hill Studios out in Coeur d'Alene, <laughs> Idaho. You got to check it out. Awesome engineer, Christy Bean is out there. So snobhillstudios.com. One thing to take note of, if you're using the AUX bus for the additional stereo headphone outsend, you also need to make sure that none of the effects engine buttons are depressed or you'll still be sending effects to the main mix, which might work great if you're recording a vocalist, for example, but for complete control, I usually just leave them turned off. The next configuration we're gonna set up for is for an overdub session. So this means we've got our digital audio workstation open on the computer and we wanna record a track to an already existing track. We wanna add some tracks to it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up an input we're going to plug into the mono input of channels three and four. This Next up, we're going to go back into the computer and we're going to go to the Soundcraft audio control panel. And we're going to navigate to the audio routing tab and make sure that inputs three and four, the stereo combination inputs, those are selected. Track. We're going to enable our channel here and we're going to track the bass line. All right, so now that we've plugged in the other side of our keyboard, we're now going in stereo. And so we want to make sure that the track we're recording in is not just the left mono side anymore, but we want to record into stereo. So we're going to choose the stereo input of our, of our Soundcraft audio interface this time. We're going to go ahead and arm the track. And now when we play it, you can hear it's got a little bit of ambience. <laughs> And we really want to keep that alive, which is why we're recording in stereo. We're going to leave all the other settings the same. The computer playback is going to be the same as well. All right, we're going to go ahead and track our clav part. So that's the Soundcraft 8FX, the addition of that extra stereo headphone out that's not just a duplicate of the mix, but its own independent mix. Man, that's amazing because that puts this thing in a completely different category and makes this little beast of a mixer truly a podcasting, overdubbing, and multi-tracking monster. And there's nothing anywhere near its price category that can do that. If this video was helpful in any way, please remember to hit the subscribe and the notification bells, and we'll see you guys in the next video.